Hello, it's Mark K6WKE, your uh, virtual Elmer this today, and uh, just getting some audio set here, so I don't uh, have distortion like I had before. And we will be starting in five minutes. Talk, talk with you soon. Let's get started here. Today is Mark K6WKE, the virtual Elmer. <clears throat> Excuse me, I got a horse throat going here this morning. Um, I wanted to finish up uh, the Tetro boards. We'd started those at like the first or second episode. 
and um, we're almost completed. So we're also going to talk about uh, a little later more about uh, some upcoming episodes and working on some pretty nifty little projects for uh, building your bench, uh, your test equipment and things. Um, and we'll talk about more of that towards the end of the towards the end of the stream. I do have a little bit of a limited time today. I only have about an hour and fifteen minutes in order to do this, so let's just jump in and and uh, get started. So we started working on the control board, and the control board does what it says. Um, it oops, board sliding. It um, controls various aspects of the tube amplifier. So it handles things like uh, the transmit and receive switching. That's what these big relays are for. Um, other voltage switching to control the trans uh, to control the, the amplifier itself. It provides circuits for uh, adjusting various voltages and things that go in uh, that are part of a properly operating amplifier and, and some protection parts. <laughs> Hey, it's the first uh, live stream of the season. Uh, and, uh, and I don't edit things like this out because, you know, this is the way life is sometimes. The board <coughs> simply falls out of the holder. Let's see if I can get this adjusted a little better. And various uh, controls various aspects of the voltages that belong in a properly operating amplifier. It's still a little loose here. And this board here is uh, pretty much complete. So. What's left to actually install is this power transistor. And um, this is actually going to need to be mounted off the board on a large heat sink um, on the order of something by on the order of four by three inches uh, with the power calculations that occurred. Uh, and all this is, is found in the Tetrode, Tetrode board manual about uh, going over the different uh, voltages, uh, what power ratings, various things, uh, components are, and so forth. Um, you can, boy, it's going to be a rough day. Drop it again. What is the deal here today, Scoop? Oh, I see what the problem is. Backside. Three. So, with the power transistors being mounted off the board, uh, there's some other power transistors. These are very large that need to be. Let me find my power transistors here. And everything uh, I've demonstrated in previous episodes on organizing parts and things. And this has been sitting for a few. About a month now before I had time to get back on it. And where are my power transistors? And they are. Well, they were in here. They are large. Uh, those are diodes, transistors, little transistors. Here we go. So these are very large power transistors that uh, need to be mounted off the board in free and essentially free space for because they need to dissipate a lot of power. And if you've never seen a power transistor, get it out of the bag here. Power transistors look like this. So mass ceramic, fine wire, uh, this is an adjustable version, and it's rated one kilo ohm at 50 watts. 
So this will be used to, to adjust uh, one of the voltages or current uh, going into the amplifier as part of the project. And as you can see, yeah. mounting onto the board is impossible. But here's the points here. So this will be mounted off board on some type of holder mount that I'll have to fabricate in this part of the chassis. It's going to be dissipating a lot of heat. So it needs to be in an area that's uh, relatively open for airflow and fans around it, more than likely. I haven't done the, the design of the case yet. Uh, I'm getting close. Once these boards are done uh, and we can test them, then it's on to building the case, which I won't be doing a live stream on that because I don't have the capabilities of, of doing metal work um, inside the shack here. I have to do it out, out on the outdoor bench. So that's what this board pretty much does. Uh, it also provides an LED indicator. And you can see all the, all the plugins, all the board connections uh, are mounted. So 12 volts, that's for like handling, switching of the relays. There's different TR switching going on, and there's all kinds of, of other board connections that are required by the amplifier. And all this is documented in the manual, how it's all, how it's all uh, put together to get there. Okay, so here's the wiring diagram, the interconnections for the diff different parts of the board. So on this board, this is the G2 control board. Um, I don't know if it's showing up on the screen. Um, the G2 control board here in the bottom shows all the interconnects. So this Q2 uh, drain going um, is right here. That's going to be mounted off board on a heat sink. This R12, the big power resistor I showed you, gets mounted off board. R14 does the same thing. Gets mounted off board. And that has nice, uh, actually has very nice, very nice, uh, well, I'm out of practice. Very nice interconnects and that's what I'm going to put on the R12 side. I'll put two interconnects there, make it easier to, uh, to mount all this. And I might actually, for Q2, I might actually um, add interconnects there as well to the offboard heatsink. So I'll be sharing that design of the amplifier uh, chassis itself. That, that'll be next up for this project. U3 needs to be installed. Uh, don't have the they don't have the uh, six-pin dip socket uh, like they have over here. Uh, I'm not a big fan of sockets, but that's part of the bill of materials and suggested by the designer. So I will just uh, go along for the ride on that one. So this wraps up the control board. And then the next part is working on the uh, rectifier ALC board. So <coughs> the rectifier takes in the higher voltages for the for the grids and things uh, at 330 volts that's an offboard connection and it goes uh, it also connects back into uh, the control board so we can get an idea of how these are all interconnected with the different uh, with the different interconnects on the board and when you're starting to put your chassis together You want to keep this in mind. You want to have, you want to have your all your interconnects laid out uh, in the document. They have it in the manual, so you know how your board is going to uh, be assembled. Or I'm sorry, how the chassis gives you uh, options for the chassis, how your boards are gonna, can fit in the chassis, and how to uh, wire them together so they function using the the 
the smallest length of wire to interconnect all the parts. So keep those things in mind. So this is more of an advanced type project. Uh, there's no instructions for it. It's just what's in the manual. There's no assembly instructions. In other words, what parts to lay down first uh, to load on the board. So when, when you're in a situation like this and you're working on uh, a project that's fairly complex with no, no build instructions, what I like to do is I work, whoops, wrong one. I work on um, what's called layered building. So components that are closer to the board go first. So a lot of these resistors are just mounted straight. They touch the board. But some of them don't. For cooling purposes, some of the higher wattage resistors are lifted off the board at least one diameter to give it some good airflow. The same with diodes. You can see there's a, a gap off the board. There's been many amplifiers I've seen and other electronic components that have some power through them that they're mounted flush on the board and there's actual heat marks on the board. And that, I mean, that's really not not a good thing to have. Uh, it should be avoided if you can. Um, sometimes it can't, it just depends. But for the most part, I try and build uh, some safety factor, cooling safety factor into the projects. So you can see a few more of the bigger power resistors are uh, lifted off the board. Same with those string of diodes over here. And these diodes are used for it's actually creating a full wave bridge. And that could be a good uh, good tutorial. I've been thinking about some different tutorials to do on how do specific components work, like how uh, how does a transistor work in, in layman terms, not with a bunch of engineering and scientific jargon thrown in uh, using everyday metaphors that you, you experience uh, around the house or working on your car or things like that. You'll be surprised that uh, even though I'm a software engineer by trade, I'm a solutions architect, uh, I design software solutions. I find that working on hardware projects is very much the same. Software and hardware are intimately related, at least in my mind, they work the same way. So for example, uh, diodes serve a certain function that could be mapped into, say, a software function. A uh, resistor has a specific function. It re limits current, voltages and things. So it has a function just like you'd have a function in software. So that's my philosophy. That's what I'm sticking to. And um, we're, we're just going to run with that thought for right now. So also, on th I've also thought about other tutorials on how do power supplies work. Um, so if you have any suggestions, you can uh, email them to me at uh, mark at ka6wke.net, and uh, we, can, we can give it a try. Uh, also, I forgot to mention that um, the chat's open. If you have questions, you can ask them there. Uh, I will not type a response, but I will, I will just answer as, as the stream goes on. So we started building the, I started building up the, the uh, regulator board uh, during between Christmas and New Year's. Um, I did all the resistors and the lower, the other components and things uh, on here like we did with the, with the, uh, with the control board. And now I'm going to uh, just start finishing uh, populating the board getting all the parts loaded and things like that. So um, I finished with, I think, all the resistors off offhand. Uh, so we're going to look at, uh, I think I left off here at resistor 108. Um, so how I, how I build the boards, like I said, I, I do a layered approach. The closer the components that need to be closer to the board are on first. Anything that needs to be off the board or are tall or taller go next, and I do it in in height order. I also work on my boards from left to right, just like you would read a book. Left to right, top to bottom. Um, 
and I need to finish. So since I haven't looked at this board in like a month, I know where I've left off because I know I've gone from left to right, top to bottom. I, I know I left off with resistor 108. So I need to pull up the, the um, parts here and um, the wrong screen. Register 108 and you use the search function in in here, so it's a meter shunt, which is uh, I don't have yet. Um, I've got the meters, but I haven't done the calculations to figure out what shunt values I need. So what what uh, a shunt is on a meter? It goes it goes here. I'll grab one. I'll grab a small one. So what a shunt does. So we have this meter that goes from zero to uh, 60 volts DC. But what if you want to say measure 600 volts? How do you how do you do that? You want to you have to figure out how to scale this meter, and that's what a shunt does. So say for example, I don't know the rating of this particular meter. I haven't looked it up yet. It's uh, full screen current is probably say one milliamp. So if you want to create a 600 volt meter, you need a shunt across here that will allow uh, so I want to say nine times the current going through the shunt and one time going through the meter. So you have 90 percent of the current going through the shunt and the sh it's a special resistor and it it it's essentially it's a resistor it attaches here sometimes it's just a metal bar if it's really high current but most of the time it, it's some kind of resistor that fits across here and allows you to scale it allows the meter to experience 0 to 1 milliamp when in act when in reality you're actually applying uh, 10 milliamps across the meter itself because if 9 milliamps is going through the shunt and 1 milliamp is going through the meter and now you've scaled your meter times 10. I believe I've done that correctly. Um, that could also be a, a great a great tutorial. I'm going to start uh, writing this down. Meter shunts, how to calculate. Don't you love live streaming? It's just like you're sitting here with me and I'm writing notes and talking out loud and getting things, uh, coming up with some ideas. So anyways, <clears throat> that's, that's what a shunt does in a nutshell. So I don't need to work on that one. Uh, R108. So the next is, um, let's go up at the top here. So some of the resistors are vertically mounted. And I haven't seen that in a long time, to be honest with you. Where the resistor is <coughs> installed on end like this. Um, Usually I've seen it in a lot of commercial, let me try to get this out of the way. I've seen that in a lot of commercial equipment, um, especially in the 70s and 80s uh, where they install resistors with one end on the board and this lead bent over. So when I install like this, I make sure the color code is all top reading. So Band one, two, three, and four, sometimes a fifth one, um, is from top to bottom. 
and on resistors, it's right reading, so it reads from left to right. So you can see this 10K right here reads left to right. And when you organize your boards and your builds this way, it makes troubleshooting a lot easier because you don't have to, um, you don't have this constant flipping the board around trying to or f calculate in your head with a resistor backwards and things like that. So you want to you want to stay organized in that fashion, um, and that's the way I do all my all my builds are done from bottom up, left to right, and right reading of the component values left to right. Now, uh, sometimes you can't do that because, for example, these capacitors, you'll notice they have different orientations. You have to pay attention to electrolytics because uh, if you put them in backwards, you will be surprised. And that could be an interesting, uh, and also an interesting video, bring back some memories of my high school electronics class where my partner, my friend Andy at the time, we would, uh, tape electrolytic capacitors down to the desk and slowly uh, ramp up the voltage until they shot across the room. And Mr. Wise, my teacher, didn't really like that very much. He thought that was not safe, but we knew he was chuckling. So I've got some other uh, resistors here I need to in put in. I've got here. It usually screws with the focus if I turn on the light. But there, okay, we'll stay with the the light on. So it's R112 and okay. And I have to figure out how to use the keyboard to switch scenes. That'll be great. So R112. Oh, it was a 10K. Let's see if they're in a schematic, but uh, we'll find it. That's C112. My R went away. All right, it's 10K. I have, for my other kit, I ran out last time. So, got a, another set of 10Ks. And you're probably wondering why aren't you using the little microscope over on the side? Because it distorts the colors. So does this. This is actually brown, black, and orange, but it's showing up as red on the screen. No, it's right. It's red. All right. <clears throat> Got to dig through my box real quick. Thought I had orange. Probably put those back accidentally. And... Uh, <laughs> Did not organize the next round of resistors. Got like I've shown in the earlier episodes where I would go through and write on the tape the values they are and put them in order. Hold on a second. Dig through this stash. I'm not sure. Yes, I should. I'm gonna have to stand up. So I'm looking through looking for brown, black, orange. None of those have it. See, this might be a really messy screen, but that's okay. Let's see. Black, orange. Right there. Brown, black, orange. Okay. Now these back in the pile. First, uh, working on the project here this year. Too much free time. See, I turn the light on and the focus gets goofy. That's better. Only. Really 
There's our little lead bender. Stick it in the holes where the resistor is going to go. And the lead. way and walk too much the camera. There we go. And on the bottom side just flare out the leads a little bit so when you flip the board over to solder it, it's not gonna fall out. So now we got that one done through the board, board still, you see, I don't see any more resistors, over the top we have R111, R111 happens to be a 10K as well, so that's fine. Electronically speaking, the resistor will work in either orientation. But you want to follow you want to follow the correct habit that I have. Alright, so looking at I think that's it for the resistor. Okay, so we'll flip the bad boy upside down. That's what I like about this particular particular um, board holder. Uh, they're not real expensive. I got mine at the Unima Hand Fest, oh, which means I'm going to miss a live stream in February, 15th and 16th. I think that's the third weekend, if it is. Find me there. And uh, yep, there it is. Hold on. Just looking for some solder here. Let's tidy up. Trimmed off. Now we talked about the difference between trimmers, you know, appropriate electronic trimmer, and not using a pair of side cutters. So the regular side cutters actually push the lead, and you want to be careful with that because you are going to have to do a repair now and again. And for components that are on a, that have tight tolerances, you could actually ruin your board if you do that. That's not good. Okay. Um, so I think we're moving on to capacitors. Uh, now you're probably asking yourself, well, why'd you put the tall capacitors in already? Um, I did that on the episode four, I think it was, just to demonstrate the 
how to well to pay attention to the uh, polarization of these capacitors. Uh, these particular ones are rated to 450 volts. Uh, if you do get those backwards, I can guarantee um, you might set some. You're gonna set something on fire. Um, <clears throat> hopefully, it'll be limited to just the cap the cap blowing off. And if you wonder why capacitors have this cross in the top Oops, that is a little bit better why they have this cross um, cut into them that's for relief pressure relief so if if something happens to the uh, input voltage or the capacitor internally fails and builds up pressure. You don't want it to explode violently. So what this, what these seams do, is pop open. Hopefully, just enough to let the magic smoke out, and not enough to cause a a full, <laughs> a full explosion in your bench. Potentially, hurting you and other equipment that you have around. Things like that. So you don't, uh, you don't want to put tape over these. You don't want to do anything like that. Just, just leave them alone. They will. S hopefully, you will never need them. But for safety reasons, uh, you definitely want to have them. Okay. So we did the diodes here. <clears throat> I'm gonna continue with the diodes now. Four is in. Let's see. What about that little top? Let me see in here. Got another six-pin dip in the middle there. I see D117. What, what is D117? Let's go back to the manual. Let's see. Oh, one in 4,000 watt. Okay, pretty standard diode. Can't find them anywhere. Where's my resistors, capacitors? I better put them in the other. Discrete components. So I'm getting close. Happened to my one in four thousand watts. Bought a bolt of them. <clears throat> More than likely, I did not put them back where they were supposed to go. So now, <clears throat> excuse me, I have to go through everything. This is turning into a showstopper at the moment. Okay, we will uh, we'll flip the capacitors for the for the time being. So let's go back to the beginning. Install. Okay, C one hundred four. Where is the C one hundred four?
is a 0.1 mic at 100 volts. I think I saw that one actually. One mic at 100 volts. So these have the seam switch. So these have the markings on them, P1M. And the markings always go on the left side. So as you can see, some of the components on this, some of the footprints on this board are a little off. Um, some so what happens is this is these boards have been around for quite a while, at least 20 years or more. And G3 SEK that developed these, you know, at the time they were developed, the footprints and things were common for that time period. So you'll see some when you order mo uh, newer parts, modern parts, you'll see that they don't. Uh, footprints don't exactly match. I don't think that really matters much. <coughs> it uh, it does make a difference in, you know, the way it looks and things like that. And that aesthetics are kind of important to me. Um, so now we have the next capacitor is C114. C114. Thirty-three picofarad or puff, short ceramic thirty-three radials. Three picofarad. We gotta flip that back. Which part's back? So thirty-three should be a little closer to the front. Across the tube resistor. Thirty three picofarad at one hundred volt. What's in there? Where's my side cutters? So this one has markings on it. <coughs> Looking the very hard to see with fifty one year old eyes. Look at that. Come on, manufacturers. Give us some contrast. Um, so what I'm using here is one of these cheap little $20 uh, USB microscopes in order to read parts and things. Uh, I recommend you get one. Uh, you can view it on the screen. We're seeing it here as part of, op I use Open Broadcast Studio to lay out the stream and what, what I'm going to be showing. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, but you can get these with viewing software and uh, have it on your bench. I recommend, if you can, to have a bench laptop or some type of computer to allow you to read manuals, uh, since a lot of stuff is in electronics, uh, in electronic format, <coughs> excuse me, and um, having the ability for microscopes and things to help you to help you view part numbers and things like that or <coughs> even to inspect things inspect the you know if you're doing a repair you can use um, a little microscope camera to look at things closely because you may not see with the naked eye cracks and things that are on the circuit board. Uh, 
on the on the traces on the circuit board. I worked on many projects where that was the problem. It was a hairline crack that you couldn't see. But um, did I put that in the? I put that in the wrong one. That's C one one five. C one one five is just put away. So sorry, Mike. So that's why you double check. You look at your component list. Look at the component list in the manual. <clears throat> I'm putting in C one one four, and then comparing it to silk screen on the board itself, I see I put it in the wrong spot. So you get out C114 after I bend the leads back in. C115 is a point one. I just put that away. I should have left it out. Bolts. in. I have to uh, flare the leads out under the board so it stays put when C119 C19 oh, back to 33. Same with that, got it fell right in nicely, so bend the leads out a bit. Just don't want to follow them, it looks like. C118. Looks like I missed one, C110. C110 is also a C120, also a point one. So C118, it's also a point one. I'm kind of glad I bought a bunch of these things. The markings for this one face the bottom of the board. Now you see why layered building is a little helpful. Because of the height of these, it's a little more difficult to get the part in. And fat finger. C120 is also a point one. Fill in nicely. Flare the leads. Okay. So now we see. Let's double check. C118, 120, 
go back up to the top of the board. C. C one twelve. Um, Another thirty three. So that's enough parts. We're just gonna flip this over and start soldering things down. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself here. So if you watched my your first kit, uh, episode five and the in the pop up episode five for finishing, uh, we went over a lot of soldering techniques. Went over um, fixed mistakes, what good solder joints look like, what bad solder joints look like, how to do the layered building um, that I've. I talk about how to test. We did that little amplifier, audio amplifier, and we tested it. And we also found out that just sitting on my bench here with a 50,000 watt AM broadcast station less than a mile away from my house, um, <laughs> you can pick up the audio. Yes, I do operate 160 from here. I have a lot of filtering. Control rights on everything. And <coughs> broadcast band filter in my receive loop. And again, at the, at the, uh, Off and if you're cutting these little, the rest of the leads off like this, don't let them fly around. Don't fly around your bench. You'll be sorry someday. Because these little things tend to move around and end up in equipment and in other projects they weren't intended for. And so I won't do that. I got a magic microscope here. them shorting stuff out um, on the longer ones I keep I put the longer ones in a box because um, you there's always times you need a little jumper or something and I do keep the longer leads handy that's what you can use them for So we had one of the little leads get stuck uh, because of the kind of got sticky right in here because of the flux actually stuck here and was going to create a short. So you want to pay attention to those things. Take your time. And the brush. Okay. So C112 already determined was a 33 picofarad, another little blue one. What time is it? 11.25. I have about 15 more minutes to go here. And I have to call it quits. Um, and the reason is, 
lunch with a good friend of mine. And then I have been spending time installing a an ICOM IC5100A in my in my new to me yeah, uh, 2016 Ford Edge. And I've got the power run into the cab. And that was a couple of weekends to figure out. Boy, they, Ford is not making things easier. Um, C117 is also a 33. And I hope that's it for the 33s because I am out of them. So this could be the end of it. All these little bags that the parts come in, keep them. You just never know. Right? Even further, I got a box that I use to store, especially the. Uh, oops, sorry about that. Oh. Uh, especially uh, the anti static bags. Keep those handy. Okay. C116 is going to be. There, an electrolytic capacitor. So, remember, those are polarized, and they're usually marked in the silk. They can be marked on the silk screen as a positive or a negative. I've, all, I've honestly, I've only really seen positives now that I think about it. So that particular one is a. Microfarad at 50 volts. So, microfarad. One microfarad at 50 volts. So, uh, I, I'm pretty sure I saw that one microfarad. Yeah, aluminum one microfarad at 50 volts. Radial. Okay, that's the one I want. Electrolytic capacitors. Quick lesson here. They are polarized, like I mentioned before, which means you have to pay attention to the positive and negative parts of the leads of a electrolytic capacitor. Uh, this is negative. If it, um, I can't say I've ever seen one that is not uh, doesn't have a label on it. In case it, you have one that's not, it's always the short lead on electrolytics. Okay? And that's why they're cut differently. So to put this on our board for C116, this is negative. This is the negative lead. This is positive. So the positive goes into the positive hole. It's really that easy. But sometimes easy to overlook and you'll know that you've overlooked it if you put one in backwards and it pops on you the relief pops and you smell well if it smells like burnt cheerios then it's then it's uh, a capacitor if you smell s something that's more of a rancid pungy smell typically that's resistors and i don't remember what transistor smell like, but yeah, my mis, uh, mischievousness in my electronics high school class, we kind of learned uh, what the different components smell like when they're, <laughs> when they let out their smoke. All right. Um, so we got C109 hanging out there. No, nope, we got to go to the top. Back to the top, we see C111, C111 is also a 0.1. Dump them all out, why don't you? Again, 
make sure it's facing. The markings are facing. C107, what could that be? C107 is 100 microfarad. Uh, 50 volts. It's kept out. 100 microfarad. Cap aluminum, 100 microfarad, 50 volt radial. Okay. Radial. What do they mean by that? So this capacitor is a radial f footprint, meaning the leads are on one end. Okay? That's all it means in a radius. Think of it that way. An axial capacitor, which I'll show you on the, on the high voltage rectifier board. On axial capacitors, it is in a straight line, same axis. Okay? And you can see the modern component compared to the original component capacitor that was in here that used to be this large. But now a modern equivalent is much smaller. I didn't redesign the board or anything. I just uh, rolled with it. And it's all completed. It's ready for testing. So let's pop that positives here, negative here. In we go, and we've got, we have here a slight crowding going on, resistor and this inductor uh, capacitor. So what do you do? Well, looking at it, there's, it's hard to tell here on the, the video, but there's fun, there's a good gap between the leads. So what I'll do is just Make sure it's flat as best as possible. Um, we've got high gain C, C108. Is it one of those? We've got 10 minutes. C108 is also a one fair. facing the bottom of the board. Flare out the leads on the bottom. Okay, what's next here? Uh, C109. C109 is also a one microfarad. Okay, okay. We're running out of those too. So that means we should be able to get on with it. C121 is at the bottom. C121 is also a one. That's the end of those. We've got C106. count because apparently I have C106 is also a 0.1 microfarad and laying around my bench didn't want to fly out looks like I'm short one Some more. Maybe it's in a sec separate package. It's for C104. Well, lo and behold, I'm short one. Okay. I'll have to fix that. I'll have to get some other ones. So what I do when I'm ordering parts, 
I usually use DigiKey. I like them the best. When I'm ordering the parts that I need, um, in the c there's different fields you can put your own customer notes in. So, for example, I copy and paste out of the bill of materials the part numbers, and I put them in the customer reference field. So that way, there's another check between what's in the manual for the b for the components and what you're putting on the board. So it'll help it'll help uh, alleviate making putting parts in the wrong spot. So for now, I think that's all I'm going to do. I'm going to just solder these down and. off there. That's from the flux burning off. And I really need to get a fume extractor in here. Which of course I have plans for a home brew flux extractor. Find them on Amazon. Ico makes one. They're by 800 bucks. Got to be um, I have one of the little desktop ones with the fan in the back, but it's not going to work very well for that. We're almost done. solder on the end of the soldering iron there because it's going to sit for a while. And I do that to melt the solder on the end of the tip to cover it because when it's sitting for a while and it's hot, it ox starts oxidizing the tip, oxidizing the tinning off the tip. And that's not good. You have to replace it after rather quickly. I have tips that are probably 10 years old, and they still work fine. Tin them up. Uh, I covered how to tin your, how to tin your soldering tips uh, in uh, your first kit, episode five. So you know how to do that. Even when I'm going to turn, like I'm going to turn this one off, turn the soldering station off. Um, oh man. So <clears throat> I've got to find C106. Um, I have a couple other C113. 
three. Let's see what the number is. Two, three. Oh, another point one. Hmm. I ordered fifteen of these. Yeah, I did order fifteen. I hope I didn't put them all in the wrong place. All right. I'll get that figured out. And then we have another bridge rectifier that goes in. And it looks like it's going to be oops, a tight fit. Looks like it's going to be a very tight fit to get that in there with that, with that electrolytic. You can see it's kind of going into the footprint there. might have to try and find a smaller electrolytic to go in there. We can spend some time at Fry's and go through the go through their uh, inventory. Let's see what they got. Another variable resistor it needs to go in. One one three is a point one, so I got two of those point ones I need to find. And then a stash of one in four thousand ones. Get all the rest of the diodes put in. There's some other small signal diodes to go in as well. And for the most part, I'm not going to be um, doing any more uh, episodes on the Tetro boards. Um, I'm going to finish them up on my own and or do a pop-up stream probably. That could work. And uh, maybe have some background music going instead of me babbling on for hours. Um, once that's done, uh, we'll be moving off into the testing phase. Uh, but I really don't want to do that until the chassis is built up enough so I can uh, actually mount boards to the chassis. And I just, well, I guess I could just do it right on the bench. But there's something about over 2,000 volts on your bench with wires just dangling all over the place uh, kind of makes the hair stand up on the back of my neck. So I do have one more thing. Um, it's more of a rant, actually. So one of the parts I ordered from DigiKey was on back order, and I got it, um, got it the other day. If this is one, I kid you not, diode that they put in this package. This is a what looks to be a 12 by 14 anti-static bag. I'm not kidding. Anti I, I got this. I'm like, what are you guys doing? I mean, it's huge. I got a body in here. So then I went to go check the part. And they've got it in another anti-static bag of the same size. Or, I don't know if this is an anti-static bag or not. But that's it. All for this one part. And it's for a PVS diode. hundred. It, it's an odd, kind of an odd, an odd diode, but it goes into D7. I'll have to figure out where D7 is. And it's not focusing very well on that, is it? Sometimes you ought to focus on this camera. There we go. That goes into D7, so we'll get that mounted. And then once that's done, once those boards are done, they're ready for testing, and testing's in the manual, how to do that. Um, I'll be testing the rectifier board as well. Um, that was done many months ago. I haven't tested it yet, but we'll get that get that going with the new newer um, modern diodes where you don't need all the balancing resistors and capacitors. So with that, I'm going to say 7.3 for now. i um, going to take off, and I'll be working on the on the edge installation this afternoon. I, I'm not going to live stream that. It's all outside. And uh, with that, I'll say 7.3, and uh, I will catch you in a couple weeks. <laughs>